So how does this really have to do with uh, Spinoza? Well, I'm getting there. But I want to make one other sort of uh, small uh, foray. There is, I think, a very common belief, it's certainly widespread amongst philosophers, that it is an axiom that you cannot derive an ought from an is. That there is this huge gap between facts and values, and that in order to have um, a decision about what you ought to do, you have to have some kind of unconditional foundation of value that tells you what unconditionally you ought to do. And I actually think that's wrong. And I think I will tell you why I think that that's wrong. The evolutionary point, of course, is that what we care about acts as the framework for what we value. So we do, of course, value food, water, sex, oxygen. But it's also the case that built into our wiring, and we can see this rather beautifully in the case of the prairie and montane voles, is that social animals also care profoundly and strongly about offspring, about mates, about parents, and about kin. Now, so what is all this stuff then about not deriving an ought from an is? Well, in a certain sense, everything hinges on what you mean by derive. In logic, we formally mean that a derivation is a, a valid argument. And the, the standard example is if P then Q, P therefore Q. If it rains, then the sidewalk is wet. It rains, so the sidewalk is wet. In contrast, it would be a fallacy to say if it rains, then the sidewalk is wet. The sidewalk is wet, therefore it rained. It might be the sprinkler. It might be the dogs. Who knows? But in fact, and Terry made this point rather beautifully yesterday, most of everyday life and most of science doesn't involve valid arguments and derivation at all. It involves an inference to the best hypothesis, to the best explanatory hypothesis, given the data that are available. And then if, that if new data becomes available and it conflicts with that hypothesis, we revise it. And that's what most of life is about. I see my child come in. She has a bunch of little red spots on her arm. I look at it. I know it's summer. She's been out in the bush. I infer that uh, she's got poison ivy, inference to the best explanation. Famously, Richard Gregory, uh, Rama's uh, supervisor, made the same observation about most of perception. The brain is making an inference to the best explanation. And this wonderful uh, illusion, it turns out that square A and square B are actually the same color. And it's very easy to show if, if I could manipulate it. You just move them together. And, uh, and they are, in fact, the same. But of course, the brain infers that you've got a uniform checkerboard and that the pillar is, is casting a shadow inference to the best explanation. And I'm sure you've all seen the little bio walker, just a bunch of dots. The brain infers that it's a person running along. Now, with regard then to morals, and here I think I, I can come back to the basic Spinoza point, we constantly make inference to the best decision. We do it in a prudential fashion. I ought to get my tires inflated. Uh, I don't have a fundamental rule about getting my tires inflated. I see that they're low. I think that it could be unwise to run the car with low tires. I ought to uh, get my tires inflated. But this also happens constantly, regularly, in the most normal of cases in the moral domain. I see my neighbor's lights are on. Uh, and he left his car lights on, I ought to tell him. I'm walking through the bush. I see a grizzly with, uh, with cubs. When I emerge from the bush, I see hikers coming in. I know I ought to tell them. Not that I unconditionally ought to tell them. Not that, that I have a fundamental moral law. It's just that 
That's what I have come, those are the, that's the expression of a skill that I have come to acquire as a result of living in this culture. So the story that I want to tell is that most moral behavior does not rest on a fundamental moral ought. And the reason that we're able to pick and choose from the Bible is that we come as a result of socialization, background education, and the fundamental wiring that evolution provides. We're able to say, despite what it says in Exodus, it's wrong to stone your child to death for dishonoring you. I mean, it does say that you do that. I've never done that, and I would never do that. <laughs> uh, it also says, in Exodus, that you shall not suffer a witch to live. I will not, you know, go on a witch hunt. I will not do that. And that's, I think, ex exactly what, what Steve Nadler was saying, which is that we bring a huge amount of moral knowledge to bear. We acquire it from imitation of our peers, from modeling ourselves after our parents. We acquire it enormously through stories and through observation of what happens to people. And uh, I mean, part of the reason that we're fascinated by Leon, uh, Leona Hemsley going to jail for cheating on her taxes is that we think, God, you know, that can really happen. Uh, and it, it's those sorts of things that over time, and in a way we don't understand just as we don't really understand how factual knowledge is integrated and made more or less coherent. We don't really understand the mechanisms behind that kind of learning. But there are people who are working, of course, uh, on the neurobiology of these things, including people uh, in Terry's lab. So ultimately, I think uh, Spinoza needn't say that it's always in our interest, although in a certain very deep sense that, that Richard Dawkins, I think, particularly understands, of course, ultimately, our social behavior is as it is, and our social wiring is as it is, you know, because Mother Nature cares about the genes. So there is, I think, a very important understanding of the nature of morality that has nothing to do with religion. And like Steve, I think it's, I, I think it's really worrisome to say that you'll burn in hell if you don't do it, so you got to do it. Um, I think there are better ways of ensuring moral motivation than scaring the crap out of people. Okay, thanks. <laughs>